Thanks for tuning in to House Things, the podcast and radio show from the David A. Howe Public Library, recorded right here in Wellsville, New York. I'm Allie Stevick. I'm Nick Gunning. Allie, welcome back. Thank you. It's good to be here again. Last time we were talking about fairy tales. Have you read any fairy tales since then? Have I read any fairy tales since then? I don't know. I don't actually think I have. No, I don't think I have either. I think I finished some of the things I was working on, but I I talked a big talk about, oh, I got to read that, but I didn't. Well, I still have plans to like read the Lunar Chronicles and all that. Yeah. But actually, my brother has been reading the Lunar Chronicles. Because of our episode? Because of our episode. Oh, wow. Okay. So, but I haven't made my way around well, to Well, we have yet. a convert, though. That's fine. I know. Yeah, I'm, I'm here I'm, for it. I'm completely fine with that. Today, we're going to be talking about Black Widow. I am so excited. Really? Are I you, love Black Widow. Do you really? I love Black Widow. Okay. Well, I'm excited to hear all about that, but you can't tell me now because right now it's bookmark time. So no fairy tales. What have you been reading? The last time we talked, we actually talked about Concrete Rose, which is on the mm. bestseller yeah. list. Angie Thomas? Angie Thomas. Yeah. And since we talked, I read it, or oh. more accurately, I listened to the audiobook on my drive to okay. from. Okay. And I really liked it. I thought it was really good. Okay. And I thought it lived up to what The Hate You Give had done. I thought it fit with that kind of tone. I regret to say that I've still only read On the Come Up. I haven't read The Hate You Give or Concrete Rose. So. Well, you still have time. <laughs> you're right. You're right. Before your next visit, I'll try to. <laughs> I'll try to get that done. Have you read On the Come Up? I have not read On So the come together, up. we're a perfect pair. We, we represent <laughs> all of Angie Thomas' outfits. We've got outfit. it all covered. <laughs> okay. So Concrete Rose, two thumbs up. Anything else on your list recently? Um, I also, again, listened to as an audiobook, Clap When You Land by Elizabeth Acevedo. Oh, okay. The audiobook was so good because it's two different sisters. Yeah. It's like prose and they're narrating and they had two different speakers for the audiobook. Mm -hmm. And I thought they both worked really well and complemented each other really nicely. And so I'm really glad I listened to it rather than just reading it but i thought that was really good as well i feel like they're putting a lot of muscle behind audiobook i think you know the podcast craze which at this point right. is like old but i feel like you know that really opened doors for audiobooks and made people maybe more open to listening to audiobooks because they were already used to you know narrative podcasts and other things so it just seems like there's been a, a push especially in that ya age range to really you know have well-produced audiobooks which is a change yeah that makes sense to me and i'm happy about it because it means i have lots of great yeah. audiobooks to listen to oh, yeah so i'm yeah. glad <laughs> i i don't know how i would get dishes done or mow lawns or commute to work if i didn't have audiobooks yeah absolutely. it's my it's my way i'm currently reading arusha which is it's one of those rick Warden presents books yeah okay and so it's again kind of a similar idea of modern mythology yeah but it's with hindu mythology okay um and it's kind of the, a lot of the content is related to stuff in the Mahabharata, mm-hmm. which I actually read a different retelling of by uh, Chitra Divakaruni okay. in college for one of my classes It's called Palace of Illusions. And I loved that. And so when I was like, oh, there's something that's kind of similar content, I was really excited. And it's been pretty good so far. I'm enjoying okay. it. Okay. Well, that sounds interesting. Last year for the summer reading program, it, the theme was myths and folklore. And I read, it was a Rick Riordan Presents. It was... Um, Tristan Strong punches a hole in the universe, which mm. was all it was like American folklore mm, mixed with some with some African folklore as well. So it was I thought it was really good. Have you read those? That's uh, Kwame and Bailey, I think reads those. I feel like well, I'm not the punching the hole in the universe, but okay. some of the, some of the folklore <laughs> I experienced as a child. Okay. All right. <laughs> that makes it sound like you actually lived it, like it happened well, to you. you just some of it I you read, read some of it people read to me, some uh, of it was, again, audiobook kind of thing. Okay. Or like, I want to say, like, focus on the family okay. things, maybe, Got something it. like that. I don't know. I remember a show that was hosted by Shelley Duvall that was like, each week we're going to talk about Pecos Bill or something like that, and I watch that all the time. But mm. we talked about this more in last year's summer reading program episode back in the All the Books show archives, Imagine Your Story, Myths and Folklore, episode 258. What do you think about that? Sounds pretty cool to me. <laughs> okay. You can find that at soundcloud.com slash all the books or anywhere you get your podcast. So is that it for your reading at the moment? Um, is that it for my reading? I know you read some Black Widow, but again, I did read some you got to save it. You, you got to save, save that. It. <laughs> um, I think the only other thing I'm reading right now is I just went on vacation and we went to a used bookstore. I love I'm it. I'm a sucker for used love bookstores. Love it. And I picked up a copy of a novel by George Sand. The title to me, I would think it should be Mao Pratt with my like English American okay. brain. Okay. I talked to my dad who actually speaks some French and mm-hmm. he said it would be something more like Mopra. Okay. So something like that. 
Okay. Um, but I started that just recently and it's been pretty interesting so far. A little huh. bit of a slow beginning as often books from that time period have. All right. Here are some things that I have been reading though that I can tell you about that are not from that period at all. No Time Like the Present, which is by Michael J. Fox. And this was one that I did listen to on an audiobook. And I've read all of his stuff so far that he's done and I've enjoyed each one. This one was this one was pretty interesting. It was kind of a mix of really his post retirement life, you know, acting stuff he's done, um, how his disease has progressed and all that. And it was it was, I don't know, it was just kind of an interesting uh, time uh, in his life and career to, to learn about, so I enjoyed that. I guest hosted the previously on X-Men podcast, and we were doing uh, an X-Men original, it was like a graphic novel, it was a five-issue thing called The First X-Men, and it was like, well, what if Wolverine founded the X-Men before Professor X? It was kind of interesting, it was by Neil Adams and Christos Gage, so I'd read that once before, but I read a Neil Adams collection from the 60s and 70s called X-Men Visionaries. And are you, how much? How much do you? You're, are you a comic book fan? I'm like working my way okay. into comic books. I wasn't before, and I was like, I want to get in, but mm -hmm. it just seems so intimidating. So slowly, slowly making progress. Okay. In. Well, Neil Adams is known primarily as as an artist, an illustrator. Really legendary stuff on like Batman uh, in in the you know 70s, early 80s kind of thing. Green Lantern, Green Arrow. He did a really epic run on. So he's mostly known for that. But he also is a writer as well, and he'd written this first X Men. So I was just looking at some of the different things he'd done, and it was interesting. His art is really dynamic and unusual, especially when you compare it to. Uh, contemporaries like in the 60s because they tended to be really more static you know mm -hmm. it was just like panel 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 head 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 <laughs> bubble 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 and his was just all over the place like mm -hmm. unusual shapes unusual colors unusual sh shading like supplemental colors that, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the it was more dynamic to look at than i think the story was to read so it was an interesting little discovery and we talked about that over on previously on X-Men. I'm currently reading one called Exile Music by Jennifer Style. I don't know why I picked this up. I mean, I like historical fiction. But this is about a Jewish family who is, you know, stuck in Austria at the start of World War II. Slowly things around them are kind of collapsing and they're realizing, like, this is not a hospitable place for us to be. It's a family of musicians and they're trying to get passports or visas to go anywhere and no one is taking them so the story is really kind of about them settling where they eventually uh, the only place they're able to get a visa to is completely different than austria of course and it's them just sort of trying to figure out life you know uh, as immigrants in a place that they never would have gone otherwise just starting from scratch so it's just a really interesting read because i've I've read a lot of World War II stuff, and it tends to focus on the things we all know of. And I've never read something from the perspective of, you know, a, a Jewish family getting out before the worst happens and just what their life is like. So it's an interesting lens to be reading the story through. Do you like historical fiction? I do. I don't know that I would say I'm like a huge historical fiction fan, right. but anytime I read it, I'm like, oh, yeah, this is, I, you know, I enjoy this. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I am liking that. And then I'm also listening to you on audio, Untamed by Glennon Doyle. This is a, a series of essays. It's nonfiction. Just been super popular, and I knew nothing about it. So I'm listening to it and enjoying it so far. And that's where I'm at. Uh, have you watched anything exciting outside of Black Widow? We just recently as a family watched a movie called State of Play, which is kind of like a journalist. Like Russell Crowe? I don't know. Like older. Uh, I want to say it was a little older. Yeah. But it was like a journalist taking down a big corporation kind of thing. Yeah. And I've I really that. enjoyed that. Yeah. That is cool. Yeah. It was a, one of my dad's finds. Kind he'll of often, a slow burn thriller, I yeah, would say. He'll often find these kinds of things that I wouldn't necessarily yeah. pick it off the shelf and be like, oh, of course I want to watch this. But mm -hmm. then when I watch it with him, I really enjoy it. Okay. So. All right. And your dad's currently growing a ponytail. My I just want, I just want to get that. <laughs> I just want that to be on the record that he is. Uh, let's look at some book news. Are you ready? I'm ready for book news. Look into the future to see what it proves. It's time for book news. Okay, I'm going to look at the young adult bestseller list since that's your jam. But as we both know, the list changes infrequently. So we'll see what surprises it has in store for us today. Number 10 with 10 weeks on the list. These Violent Delights by Chloe Gong. A reimagining of Romeo and Juliet's at 1920 Shanghai. What's huh. your what's your hot take? I'm not sure. I feel like I've been seeing this a lot around on Goodreads. Okay. But I didn't actually really look into it at all. But that's not what I would have expected it 
the summary to be about. Hmm. So that's kind of interesting. It seemed to pique your interest. You were like, huh. But no. I just, it went so many different places <laughs> <laughs> so quickly. A reimagining of Romeo and Juliet and yeah. Shanghai and 1920s. That's just a lot of things all at once. Okay. Yeah, I agree. I agree. A lot going on. Number nine was six weeks on the list. I don't think this was on last time you were here. Ace of Spades by Farida Abike Lamide. An anonymous texter known as Aces reveals secrets about an elite private school's only two black students. Good cover. It's like a playing card. I like the look of it. Cool. Number eight, 68 weeks on the list, stamped, of course, an exploration of racism and anti-racism in America. This has been here quite a while. Number 15, no, sorry, number seven with 15 weeks on the list, Rule of Wolves by Lee Bardugo, the second book in the King of Scars duology. Have you read her? I have not. She's, and I think this was here last time. I think so. 15 weeks on the list. So yeah, probably Seems so. Familiar. Yep. I Still, the only thing I've read by her is her Wonder Woman book. I mean, Wonder Woman is pretty great. She is. She is. But we're talking about Black Widow today, so try to keep on point. <laughs> Number six, 26 weeks on the list. We have Lore by Alexandra Brack. And I know this was here because we, we, definitely talked about we this. deduced that this was a Medusa situation. To get revenge for her family's murder, Lore must re-enter a hunt known as the Aegon. Number five, 222 weeks on the list. We were just talking about this earlier. The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas. A 16-year-old girl sees a police officer kill her friend. Number four, 10 weeks on the list. Realm Breaker. A small band of misfits attempts to save Allward. Number three, oh, new this week. Are you excited? Oh, I'm so excited. Okay. Six Crimson Cranes. Is that from the 12 Days of Christmas? You know, that verse sounds a little familiar. It does, yeah. Shiori must break a spell that turns her brothers into cranes. Okay. What would you do if your brothers were turned into cranes? I'm really not sure. Okay. I'm a little fearful to think what my brothers would be like as cranes. As cranes. <laughs> sounds a little dangerous. Okay. So I mean, think... I suppose I would try and disenchant them, but I okay. might, you know, make them fly around it's, a little first. Yeah, it's just interesting you didn't jump right to helping them. Uh, well, I was just so caught off by the idea of my brothers as cranes. That okay. It just it took we'll, me a moment to process we'll say the that's magnitude why. of that reality. We'll say that's why. Number two with 16 weeks on the list, Firekeeper's Daughter. Donis investigates a deadly new drug being distributed in her tribal community. Hmm. And, oh, this looks like, I think maybe this has the Reese Witherspoon sticker on it. I can't oh. tell. It's a very small picture. So don't don't quote me on that. Don't take that to a bank. Maybe it has. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, we cannot. It's too close to call is what we're saying. <laughs> Number one, 180 weeks on the list. One of Us is Lying by Karen M. McManus. For five students, a detour into detention ends in murder. So it's kind of like a murdery breakfast club. The yeah, that's kind of what it sounds like. The breakfast like. club <laughs> ends in <laughs> murder, murder. You know, so different than the breakfast club. All right. Um, what on there do you think is going to make? Because last time you read Concrete Rose, anything on here going to make, make, it, it, gonna to make it to your to read list? Hmm. The one about the cranes did sound pretty interesting. The cranes. Yeah. Okay. I'm also intrigued by the Romeo and Juliet in 1920s. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you can read those and report back to me because I don't want to read either one. <laughs> Six Crimson Cranes was that title. Five Golden Rings. Four Golden Rings. <laughs> We don't have the rights. You can't sing it. Uh, all right. So that's the young adult hardcover bestseller list. And we have a lot of these here. And probably some more will be on the way now that we know how exciting they are. Mm -hmm. How many cranes are flying around. A lot of cranes. All right. Let's get to the topic at hand. Black Widow. Of course, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Black Widow uh, in our thoughts at the moment because the movie's out, finally, finally. after 10 plus years of seeing Pretty Scarlett much. Johansson. I was a child and now I'm an adult. One That's how long it's been. <laughs> <laughs> I still had a glimmer of youth and now it's all gone. That's how long it's been. I don't know why it's taken this long to give Scarlett Johansson a movie because she's like one of the biggest movie stars there is outside of Marvel. You know what I mean? Yeah, no, she's like... In so many things, if you look like up the, you know, like look up the Google page, yeah. all the movies and TV she's in, it's so long. Oh, I know. And like with the exception of maybe Robert Downey, well, definitely Robert Downey Jr., but Robert Downey Jr. and Paul Rudd may be more uh, well-known before this started. But mm -hmm. outside of those two, I would say she's more high profile than all the other actors I think I would agree. in the Marvel like universe. Yeah. So who knows why it's taken this long? I don't understand. I know. Do you think sexism was at play? Oh, hmm. do, you, do you think that could have played a role? <laughs> that's a really interesting idea. Well, we'll never know. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, but that's why that's why we're talking Black Widow today. So how do you want to get into this? I think we should save the movie for a little bit later. Okay. 
time. And let's talk about Black Widow origins. So you said you're a big Black Widow fan. Is that because of the movies or were you aware of her prior to that Iron Man 2? It is because of the movies. It is. Again, okay. like I said, um, comic books are kind of territory that yeah. I'm slowly working my way into, but not something that I really grew up with. Okay. And so, again, my first encounter with her was the Avengers movie that I watched when I was, again, I don't know, 12? Oh, so Something not like even that. Iron Man 2, but like not even straight Iron Man up 2. Avengers. I, okay. I, I watched things kind of all out of order. So I can't. I, I can't with that. I didn't mean to. It just sort this of is, happened that way. It's a way. good thing you didn't bring this up in your interview because I just, I don't know if I can <laughs> handle this out of continuity. But I, see, this is going to make you cringe so much. I actually <sighs> watched Iron Man 2 for the first time just a couple of weeks ago. I'd really? seen like all the clips with Black Widow in okay. them, but I hadn't actually seen the whole movie. And so I was like, all right, Black Widow's yeah. coming out. We got to do this. Yeah. And it was a little different than I expected. But yes, my first encounter mm-hmm. was not Iron Man, in fact, but the first Avengers movie. The first Avengers. Probably a better showcase for the character. She comes out strong in Avengers. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think, you know, in Iron Man 2, she starts out um, undercover. She's posing as Tony's assistant, and you only learn later on that uh, she is the Black Widow. So it's kind of a you know a gradual like oh something's up yeah. with this character where avengers it's the there interrogation scene right that's where she's first like scene yeah, yeah. That interrogation that's scene. pretty good and so i think that just had me hooked of yeah. like how she just kind of turns the whole situation around mm-hmm. and you know walks out carrying her high heels and is like i've got this yeah, yeah, i yeah. love it. I mean, 12 year old me was like oh, sure. this is the coolest thing i've ever seen yeah so that was it and and i mean what at that point what else was there as far as female like superhero representation i mean there wasn't nothing not, right? especially I mean, if you don't read comic books right. like they're I'm trying to think there really wasn't well, there well, i mean there's, there's lois lane the but she's not a super she's cool but she's not a superhero True. you know like you're right i mean just just not a ton going on at the moment her first appearance in avengers the movie where she, where she is you know she's playing on people's underestimating her is kind of a through line for the character all throughout the MCU right up to and including the Black Widow movie which I think is kind of cool that she takes people's expectation and subverts them so I I do like that I would probably have to say that I don't know I I feel like the MCU in a lot of ways is the thing that really like introduced me to the character I've always loved comics I mean I've always been a comic reader and always watching you know Super Friends when I was a kid and all of that but I've always been much more into the DC universe like Mm -hmm. even as a kid but I think too at the time DC was like on fire you know Batman Mm -hmm. and Superman and uh, Super Friends as I said I mean there were always DC animated stuff going and until I don't know, like X-Men, the animated series and Spider-Man and some of the things around then, there really wasn't a lot of like Marvel representation, I feel like, in pop culture for my age anyway. And so I was aware of the Avengers and I had like old Captain America episodes on VHS, but I didn't really gravitate towards the comics. And so I wasn't super well versed, even in in characters like Iron Man and stuff. Mm -hmm. Outside of Captain America, I, I would recognize them, you know. And so, like, certainly pre-MCU, I, if I would have seen a picture of Black Widow, I would have been like, Black Widow, she's an Avenger, she's a spy. And that was really, like, the extent of my knowledge of her, because I just hadn't read a ton of stuff with her in it. So, when she started showing up in the MCU, I guess that's maybe when her stock sort of was rising, and mm-hmm. she was appearing in more and more comic books. But let's talk a little bit about her origins. Have you read any Black Widow comics? I have read some Black Widow comics. Okay. So she debuted, um, much like in the MCU, she debuted in, in an Iron Man story in Tales of Suspense number 52, which came out in 1964. Tales of Suspense was kind of kind of like an anthology book, and then eventually Iron Man took over as, as a main mm. character, mm-hmm. usually alternating with Captain America, I think. So she appears that way there and really is just sort of like an evil Russian spy. And it's not till a little later in like some Spider-Man stuff and Avengers and Daredevil where she defects and becomes an Avenger and is, is a good guy. And there she kind of bounced around for a while. I mean, she had her own, not title, but she was like the lead character in uh, in some other uh, Amazing Adventures for a while. It was like her and the Inhumans were bouncing back and forth. And she would primarily be associated either with Daredevil or with the Avengers. And that's just kind of how it was for a long time. She'd pop up in, uh, you know, a lot of times the animated cartoons, which is redundant, but the cartoons (laughs) would have (laughs) a Black Widow episode or something like that. But she was rarely a focus. So I think the Wasp really was much more like if you had to pick, you know, a prominent female Avenger, I think 
really until the MCU, you probably would have said the Wasp because she was always just much more present in things. So I've read a ton of Black Widow comics. I started reading them when the movie was originally supposed to come out. So like in late 2019, 2020 was when I was like, mm. oh, I got to catch up Get on prepared. some Black Widow. You had plenty of so time. I have read a bunch at this point. What are What's your favorite? What do you like best? So what I did was... I got out a whole bunch from the library just a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, this is the time. I'm so excited. And mostly what I read was the like the Widowmaker collection. OK. Which was interesting because I since again, it's a collection. It was kind of just all over the place. So some yeah. of them I was like, oh, yeah, this is great. And some of them I was like, oh, mm -hmm. I don't know about this. And it was interesting, I feel like, to see just how much range there was in how she was presented in terms of like, is she kind of. I don't know, a little bit of like a femme fatale mm -hmm. or what's going on. But I guess what stood out from that collection was the Marjorie Lou work. So it's collected in a couple different ways. The Marjorie Lou one gets its own little slim volume or we have like a Black Widow, you know, kind of like an epic collection or an anthology that has multiples in it. But the Marjorie Lou one on its own, if you were to look for it, is called The Name of the Rose. Why did that one stand out to you? What did you like about it? So I think some of what really stood out to me about it was that it really felt like it was her perspective, her being a woman, being herself. In so many of the other ones, it felt kind of like she's there and she's the main character, but she's kind of dancing around all these other Avengers, all yeah. the men Avengers. <laughs> yeah. And again, in quite a few of them, there was kind of this dynamic of like, oh, she's dated all these Avengers. Let's mm -hmm. go mm -hmm. and have her talk to every Avenger who she's ever dated. Right. And I was kind of like, great yeah. perfect <laughs> but that's what you want in that one even though she's dating someone which i have no objection to but it felt like that was more about her and having a real relationship and yeah. not just kind of this i don't know list well i think they kind of fall into that trap in the mcu a little bit don't you think i, I think mean, i would agree yeah because in, in Iron Man 2, I mean, she's undercover. And so she's, you know, purposely being flirtatious with Tony and everything. But I think you have, I mean, you can say Winter Soldier, she and Cap kind of have mm -hmm. a thing. Uh, her and Bruce Banner, of course, like right. a, as it goes on. Before you know more about Hawkeye, I think in the first Avengers movie, you get a little bit of like, oh, maybe they're a couple. And I don't think that was an accident on no, that no, part at no. all. So. I don't think it was either. I think they're just kind of playing on that trope. They're right. like, oh, we have a girl. I'm using air quotes, everyone. Right. Like, we have a girl, so we have to, you know, have we have to see. Things. Right, exactly. Like, date everyone. And it really, you know, it, it doesn't serve the character well. Um, but let's go back to, to something you said there where you said that she, in a lot of the ones that you read, she wasn't really the main character. Um, that's a great pivot point to talk about the Margaret Stoll book, uh, Black mm. Widow what's that called uh, forever red forever so red. it's a two two volume series forever red and red vengeance these are ya stories and ali and i both read these and originally we were kind of thinking that would be our primary topic here right. but after reading it i just I, I we kind of agreed that there wasn't really enough to talk about because black widow is really not the main character she's really not which was a surprise not what i was expecting yeah and not what I was really wanting. Yeah, no, I agree. Because, I mean, you have the obvious thing here. Black Widow, up until that point, didn't have any sort of, you know, standalone movie or anything like that. So if you were a Black Widow fan, it was like, go and track down some of these comic book runs. But a lot of them, or at least the ones that I've read, are not that open to you can just pick it up and read it. Like, you you kind of need to know what's going on in the whole world. Yeah. So when I heard that they were going to do this YA novel, I kind of thought, oh, great. This is a perfect entry point. Like, obviously written on the heels of the MCU, you know. So if you're a fan and you're you're watching these movies, yeah, go to this book. That's just not the case, though. Mm -mm. No. Because it really, I don't know. I mean, it's more about a teen romance. Yeah. And I didn't find the teen romance very compelling. Yeah. Which I guess made it worse that not only was it kind of focused on a teen romance, but it was a teen romance that I was kind of like, really? This yeah. Is, I don't, I didn't find it believable. Yeah. And sometimes even when I don't find something believable, I'm like, all right, well, we can just, you know, mm -hmm. we can suspend disbelief and yeah. go with it because I don't know, it's fun or it's, you know, whatever. It has something redeeming. I just really wasn't feeling that teen romance at all. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. And... <sighs> I guess I would have just liked her to be more at the forefront because I don't even really think she's that well portrayed in it. Like the no. characterization, I d didn't really it like was, her. Yeah, no, I, which I thought was really interesting. Mm -hmm. I started the book and I was like, okay, here she is. And I was like, great, let's go. I'm excited. And then 
as soon as these two teen characters show up, she's like not very nice to them <laughs> no. or supportive. And I don't resonate with that a yeah, lot. Yeah. But I was like, okay, this is going to be really interesting because there are a lot of people and women in particular mm-hmm. who are expected to really be um, supportive and loving toward teens and younger people. And that's just not as mm-hmm. much in their wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. It's not, you know. And so I was like, okay, this will be an interesting experience in empathizing with someone who is pretty different from yeah. me and seeing like, how can I, you know, get into her head and think about why is she not the nicest to these teens? Why mm-hmm. is she frustrated with them? And so I was really excited about kind of having that experience. And then as time goes on, she becomes nicer to the teens. <laughs> right. And I became increasingly more frustrated. Yeah. It was like we switched positions right. and I was like, these teens are the worst. And she was like, oh, I'll be nice to them now. And I was like, what? What has just happened? Yeah. I haven't read the sequel, which is called Red Vengeance. I I have not heard anything about a third coming out. Have you seen that? I anything? have not. Okay. No. So what I've heard and the reviews on Red Vengeance seem to indicate that they kind of learned something from this first book and the, and the sequel's a little bit more in line with what you might want in a Black Widow story. This one just didn't leave me wanting more. You know? Not really. I could see a world in which I'd pick up the sequel just to kind of check it out, especially after the movie. But I haven't yet, mostly because I just, I don't think that's a... I don't think that's a good representation of the character. And that's something when I was going through, you know, my own reading of of Black Widow and making sure we had stuff for the collection. I always like to have, you know, when when there's a new superhero movie like this that comes out, you always have people who are interested in that character and their only experiences with the movie. So I like to try to make sure that we have in the collection something that I can point to and be like, here, try this one. I honestly don't know what I would say for Black Widow. You know, like the, the comics that I've read, I don't know that there's a good comic book run that it would be like, okay, you've watched the movies, you'll like this. I don't know. Yeah. Would you say the Marie Lu one is the best? I would say that's probably the best, but I wish there was more of it. <laughs> there was a three-volume series called, well, just called Black Widow, by Nathan Edmondson, and that focuses a little bit more on her. It's not, I don't know. It's It's almost less of a superhero story and more of just like a, you know, this lady was an Avenger. She was a spy. Now she's just kind of like living her life and huh. still like superheroing every now and then. It it reads kind of like a like a nineteen seventies spy story, and I like that. I think it's cool. It looks great. Like the art in this three volume mm-hmm. series is really stylish and really just consistent and cool. And I wish the story was as strong as that was. But I would almost say that series maybe is the place to go, just because you get three volumes of it and you can kind of settle into what the story is. Um, classic fans, there's all sorts of Black Widow collections out there. There's one called Black Widow, The Sting of the Widow, which collects all of her early appearances. And that's probably one if you, you know, if, you, if you're if you interested in older comics and interested in the origins, that's a fun place to go. But I'm kind of reluctant to push anybody towards any of the comics I've read. The exception to that might be the current series, which is written by Kelly Thompson. The first volume's out right now, which we have in the collection. Oh, and we do? It's called, well, it hasn't arrived yet. Oh, okay. I'm excited. It, I'm but it's on order. It. It's called The Ties That Bind. And this, it helps if you have just some sense of who characters like Winter Soldier and Hawkeye are. Like, if you kind of like, okay, I know who that is. Then you can kind of fill in the gaps with the relationships and things because it's kind of a, you have to do a little guesswork there. But I just think it's a it's a really good representation of the character. But it works a little better if you have that familiarity with, mm. like, the Marvel Universe, with the, with the Avengers in general. I think the second volume's coming out a little later this year. I thought that was really cool. And that that's been my favorite so far. Let's talk a little bit about her characterization in the MCU because she's been at this point, I want to say, nine movies, do you think? I'm going to look at the list. It sounds plausible, but I don't know. Iron Man 2, Avengers, Captain America the Winter Soldier, Age of Ultron, Civil War, Infinity War, Endgame. She does the post credit scene in Captain Marvel and Black Widow. So if you're going to count the Captain Marvel, then it's nine. Okay. Nine movies total. What do you think of her trajectory just across the MCU? Well, it's interesting because, I don't know, again, like we were talking about a little bit, it starts out, and I felt like, and again, since I watched Iron Man 2 kind of at the end Mm -hmm. of everything else, it was really weird to see the origins of her character because it's so different from how she turns out. She's so quiet, Mm -hmm. and again, very kind of in this flirtatious role, and it just didn't really feel like the Black Widow I knew. I'm so glad they pivoted away from the hair she had in that that, that as well. <laughs> Not my favorite of the hairs. 
but so I guess I find it really interesting how I feel like what her arc did kind of end up becoming is kind of this how she's a central figure in the Avengers and is dealing with her past but also you know becoming kind of a a found family with the Avengers and then ultimately I don't know can we give endgame spoilers (laughs) Mm, yeah (laughs) but I found that to be a satisfying conclusion to her arc I just wish that they'd made a whole bunch of Black Widow movies in you know yeah earlier in the meantime well it's hard because I feel like when she is the only, I mean, until you get the Wasp, and even then the Wasp is really more of a supporting character. Like, and she's really it, you yeah. know? Like, she's the only female character in the Avengers. You have Black, you have Captain Marvel, but she kind of stands apart in her own thing, and then she kind of shows up as the heavy, but she's not been a central figure. Not Black at all. Widow is as close as you get. But even so, I feel like she's often used to flesh out the other characters, mm-hmm. not vice versa. Yeah. You know, you learn more about Hawkeye through her. When In Winter Soldier, you kind of learn more about what Cap's going through through her. I don't know that she has a ton of what her own story is moving forward. Like, you certainly glean what her story is and what she's dealing with, but I don't know that that really got enough. It certainly didn't get enough focus, I don't think, until the movie. Yeah, I would agree. What was your overall view of the movie? I enjoyed it. Yeah, I really... Like, again, I wish that they'd made mm-hmm. a whole bunch more Black Widow movies, you know, thinking about how Iron Man has three movies, Thor has mm-hmm, three movies, mm-hmm. Captain America has three movies, Yeah. now we have one Black Widow movie. Right. Um, but anyway, but yeah. regardless of kind of that frustration and the weight, I do feel like I was satisfied with what I was given. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I was thinking about, you know, now you watch it after the fact, and it is, I think it... It's hard because it is so tightly packed between Civil War and the next time you see Black Widow that there's not a ton of, like, the things you see in this movie. I mean, there's just really not space to let them play out. But I think going forward, like, watching that movie in its proper place, like, finishing Civil War and then watching it, I think that will give you a, a different view of Black Widow because I really feel like this was the best portrayal of her that we've ever gotten. You know, you see a different side of her that I think would have been welcome in the other movies had they ever decided to make room for it because I just felt like her acting and in the depth that she brought to it because she was given the space to like work that out, I think really brought something new out of the character that I honestly wasn't expecting this late in the game Mm -hmm. to see a different version of her. And I liked it. I Mm -hmm. really, I mean, I appreciated that. How did the movie stand up? Because, I mean, uh, you know, this has been like your childhood to adulthood that you've been watching this character. Is the payoff of finally seeing a Black Widow movie, like, is it enough for you? I mean, I would be more satisfied if there would be more movies. Like, yeah. And I know, like, I don't know, Scarlett Johansson's kind of out of the MCU. Right, And, but I guess I wish that now that we were doing this, we could also maybe go back and fill in some of the gaps. Yeah. I think after the winter soldier captain america the winter soldier mm-hmm. would have been a great time for yeah. a black widow movie because she has to deal with kind of the fallout of what's happened with shield mm-hmm. and i think that would be fascinating i agree i'm i'm curious as to why like i'd be interested to know if this movie or the, a version of the script has been kicking around since civil war like why they felt the need to sort of hem it in so closely to those movies because we just don't get a lot of her past. Like when she's not on the screen, we don't really know what she's doing. Right. You know what I mean? And so I agree with you. I think that, I think we could have had a black widow trilogy that kind of fits in the open spaces of the MCU, but the placement of this, I think it'd be weird to do like a prequel to what is essentially a prequel at this point. Yeah. Not that I'm against it. I just think that would it be would an be unusual little, approach. Well, it would have made more sense if they'd kind of done it in order as they were. That's what I mean. Out. Yeah. But I do. Like, I feel like we easily could have had three black women. Oh yeah. We could have had an early stuff, how mm-hmm. she gets out, joins shield, yeah. you know, the Budapest stuff that we've right. been hearing about. Right. I feel like everyone would want to, you know, everyone yeah, would I do. be down for I that. Agree. And then I agree. again, after winter soldier, and then maybe the one we have now. Yeah. Like, and there, right there, you have a trilogy. I know, you got it. <laughs> so I guess I'm both satisfied, but a little bit wishing that there was still more or that I didn't have to feel like, okay, now this is wrapped up and this mm-hmm. is all I'm going to get. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, you know, you, you get a sense that like Yelena, who's like the secondary character in the movie, is going to go forward. We're going to see more of like the Black Widow world through her. And I really, I mean, Florence Pugh did a great job in, in that role. I, I mean, I loved her. She was kind yeah. of my favorite part of the movie. And so I'm excited that we're probably going to see her in the Hawkeye show and we're probably going to see her as a more, 
I don't know. I hope she I hope she gets more prominence in MCU going forward because I think that she's deserving of it. But you know, going into this movie, I was a little like, yeah, okay. You know what I mean? Because mm-hmm. I just I felt like, but we've we've seen the end of this character, and like, mm-hmm. how much could we possibly get out of being like? But here's what she was doing these two weeks, you right? Know? Yeah. And I think especially on the heels of uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier, I was kind of like not in the mood for it. Did you watch Falcon and the Winter Soldier? Mm -hmm. What did you think? I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I thought it was excellent. I don't know. I don't know what my problem is, but I just was kind of like, whatever, you know, like I wanted more of like the buddy cop premise that I feel like they kind of teased. I didn't watch the trailer. So I think I went into it with no expectations and I think that served me well. Well, There's a scene in Civil War where they just kind of are openly hostile to each other in a really petty way. And that cracked me up. And I guess I wanted the whole series to really be more of like a I don't know like a lethal weapon rush hour kind of Mm -hmm. vibe like between the two of those characters and it became I think more of a serious like spy thing and I just sort of felt like I mean I've seen that before and I liked it better elsewhere and so I think that maybe put me in in kind of a bad mood about Black Widow because I thought okay it's just going to be the same kind of thing again but I was really pleasantly surprised by it like I really liked the movie in a Mm -hmm. way that I wasn't expecting to and I think a lot of it for me was just getting to see Scarlett Johansson like do what she does, mm-hmm. you know, like what she does really well. She does, especially in this movie. And it and it sort of, I don't know, I guess I kind of forgot the things that I'd seen her in that I really liked, you know, like she did a, a, a murder mystery with um, Hugh Jackman called Scoop, which is great. And, mm. You know, she just has a bunch of stuff that uh, I, I really like her in and I just don't think they've really utilized her well in the MCU when yeah. you see something like black widow and you see what she can do, she was just really engaging to watch. And I, I really, I mean, I would rank this movie pretty high. Like it's the kind of thing where the more I think about it, uh, the more I like it. Yeah, you know? no, I totally agree. Especially cause like already, you know, on my Facebook feed, I've been seeing some of my friends, you know, having some complaints about yeah. the movie and saying, Oh, here, I think this or that. And I, Try not to engage in Facebook arguments, even if it's about something that I really care about. <laughs> That's a good... Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. the point being, not the Facebook arguments, but that as I read kind of these criticisms and think about, if I were to argue back in the comments, what mm. would I say? Mm-hmm. I feel like I just become more and more satisfied with what there is. And yeah. I say, no, okay, they've raised this criticism, and I don't think it's valid. Here's mm-hmm. why, in my mind, I think this makes sense and was yeah. really successful well so here's full disclosure here's here's how it happened for me i went to see it with my little brother and we didn't have a babysitter so my wife was like oh just go and you know we'll catch it some other time so i went and saw it and we left and we were both kind of like yeah it was fine you know mm-hmm. i just didn't really have a lot of like things because there were little things like thinking about the comics and thinking about you know the movies as a whole i had sort of a list of like well this didn't really gel or I didn't like this or Mm -hmm. this wasn't enough for me or whatever. And then we ended up seeing it again uh, at the drive-in and I just liked it a thousand times more the second time. And I think because all those little like nitpicks that I had in my head, which I think just like come with being a comic book fan, you Mm -hmm. know, I was able to just kind of put those aside and watch it just as a movie. And I did really like it. I mean, I, I really, I don't know. I'm glad that I saw it the second time because I was able to kind of shake off any like lingering, like, eh, you know, reluctance mm-hmm. I had about it. It was just like, no, this is actually like a really a cool movie. I really love what they did with her, with the atypical family structure yeah. that they played with, you know, because that's always kind of a theme, like with the Avengers, you right. know, just finding like this family. And so to see her in that role, uh, and it's just such a great cast, you know, like David mm-hmm. Harbour and Rachel Wise are so good in it. Um, and I think they really sold this, like, you know, we're, we're a artificially constructed family unit that was put together for a specific reason, but you know, there's still these sort of lingering vibes and they kind of keep coming back to those roles in a way that I've just found really satisfying. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So going from like that initial scene you saw in Avengers to the Black Widow movie, like what are the things that stand out to you the most about the character? Like, do you find this to be an inspiring character I mean, what does it say that this is like the female Avenger that that we got? You know, like what's your interpretation of that overall? Well, I think it's really interesting that this is the female Avenger that we got because I guess there's there's some things about her that I feel like a lot of women are like, oh, yeah, Mm -hmm. you know, I can relate to that. But I feel like there's other things about her that are 
maybe not as much of like a this is super you right. know relatable for mm-hmm. every woman not always universal right <laughs> and so and i think in some ways it's better to have a woman character who's not as universal because yeah it makes her more of a real person and i guess it makes her less just feel like okay she's mm-hmm. the woman even though that's kind of exactly what was happening yeah and i feel like both in the movies and in the comics that i've read i feel like it keeps being kind of this exploration of what does it mean to be a woman is she again like in the in the YA novel that we read is she going to be a kind of supportive mm-hmm. older sister figure or is she going to kind of push away from some of those traditional yeah. caretaking womanly kind of mm-hmm. roles or is she going to be some kind of like, you know, uh, objectified sort of figure mm-hmm, that men look mm-hmm, at? Or mm-hmm. is she, you know, like, what's that going to look like? And so I feel like continuing to kind of explore that, the womanhood in her and things about her that are different, you know, like she can't have children, which mm-hmm. is something that isn't in any way necessary to be a woman, but mm-hmm. is something that is often has historically been associated with women, sometimes for good, sometimes not yeah, for good. Definitely. Yeah. And so I think just there are so many elements of her character that some of them are more woman-like and some of them are less like the Mm -hmm. stereotypical idea of a woman that kind of explores what that is. And so I guess that's some of what I find really interesting about her. And I really liked, I feel like where we landed in this movie of how in some ways she still, you know, has some things that are not the most every woman per se, but that I feel like in this movie, we really see her compassion. Yeah. And that really rings true to me. Yeah. Uh, so I really appreciated that. Yeah. Well, like I said, I mean, seeing different side is nice, but it's just, I don't know. I mean, it's, it goes without saying, but it's just a little unfortunate that that by being the only female character that you get, she sort of has to be the stand-in, right? Yeah. I mean, where you have so many men characters, you can sort of be like, I'm an Ant-Man or, you right. know what I mean? Like, I right. relate to Tony Stark. But like, if you want to look for a woman character, you just, you don't get a lot. And that's that's something that I feel like comics have been historically terrible about. And it's only recently. And I mean, very recently that you've started to get a little bit more, you know, wider and more accurate representation, both in the characters that you see and the people who are writing and drawing them. Mm -hmm. Like it was only until recently that black widow was written by a woman, you know, like in her past it was, it was all men, you know, like all men creative teams. It's kind of weird. Yeah, it is. <laughs> That's what I mean. Like, why would you do that? And, you know, if you look at, like, both DC and Marvel in the early days, I mean, Supergirl's original story, she had to, like, hide out in an orphanage and pretend not to be super so that she didn't give away Superman's secret identity. Like, that was how the mm-hmm. character of Supergirl started and was for years. And Wonder Woman was you know a breakout character early on but she was still always sort of treated as the girl like when she was in the justice society you know in the 40s and 50s she was the secretary of the justice society like wonder woman was the secretary (laughs) well and i feel like you know i don't know it's that kind of thing of like what it means is that like you were saying if you're a woman and you're a superhero fan you kind of have whether you're a dc fan or you're a marvel fan you kind of have one to go to and so I don't know. I feel like anytime someone says, oh, you know, like what, when you were a little girl, what mm-hmm. superhero did you want to be like? It's like, well, I only have like one yeah, right. option, <laughs> Wonder, much, Woman, yeah, say Wonder Woman, or yeah. if it's Marvel, then yeah, like, I yeah. don't know. So not a fan of that situation. Yeah. I mean, are you seeing progress? Would you say like as, as we go forward with more movies and comics and books and things? I think so. Yeah. And like, even just like, I really enjoyed the WandaVision show. And I felt like that gave us more of Wanda that I really wanted. Mm -hmm. Since she appeared as a character in the MCU, I was like, give us more. And so, but I mean, I remember like after I saw Infinity War with my friends, I was there with like three of my girlfriends Mm -hmm. and one of my, my guy cousin. And we were talking amongst ourselves and it was kind of, again, like that, which of us would be which superhero mm-hmm. kind of a thing. Mm-hmm. And once you get to Infinity War, you have some, you have, some you have one more, one than, more than one option. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so it's like, well, okay, one of us can be Black Widow. We'll all fight about who it is. Right, of one course. of us can be Gamora. Mm-hmm. One of us can be Wanda. Mm-hmm. And then I feel like, I don't know, maybe there was another one. Yeah. There must have been, you know, we yeah. pulled, dredged someone up. The Wasp, right? The Wasp is around. The, or the, the Black Panther characters. she wasn't in that movie, I don't think. I think it was one of the Black Panther yeah, yeah. characters, which mm-hmm. again, we're like, okay it feels it feels a little weird yeah. but <laughs> i guess one of us can yeah. be sure yeah i guess so. um and i guess it's nice that now we're in a place where it's like well okay we don't have great options yeah. but if we want to just for fun kind of assign roles yeah we at least have enough so that we're not all one person right 
Yeah. So <laughs> I'd say that's progress. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, that's ma- true. maybe faint praise, but uh <laughs> it's just silly to think about like it, it just seems to be the mindset of like well women don't like these or like is anybody come out going to come out and see a superhero movie that's fronted by a woman and, and it like it took Wonder Woman to sh- be like yes <laughs> yes we will people will come see that <laughs> and not just women and like even if it was just women like do it you know right. like I that's just, still more than half the population there you go exactly like, it's like want? it's just such a weird weird mindset to still be so prevalent and I just I don't understand it yeah so. I don't know, but I, I am happy to report that, that the Black Widow movie was very cool. And I I hope that we see more of these characters popping up down the road. I, do, I feel like they threaded a needle that we're going to at least kind of see the Black Widow world going mm-hmm. forward. Did you get that vibe? Yeah, I think so too. So And like, again, I'm excited about more Florence. Like, she's yeah, yeah. amazing. Oh, yeah. So I know. That, that really was an unexpected breakout character in mm-hmm. that movie. I just really liked everything she brought to it. Yeah. I liked to see actors like just use every moment. And I feel like that's what she does. Like whether she's the focus or not, she just kind of like adds a little kick to every scene that she's in, which was, which was cool to see. All right. Let's set the Black Widow movie aside. Outside of that, what's your favorite Black Widow moment in the MCU? I, I do really like that first kind of interrogation scene. Yeah. yeah. That's really fun. Mm Mm-hmm. I do really like her sort of climactic moment in Endgame as much mm-hmm. as I also hate it. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> but I feel like, I don't know, some of what I really enjoy is just kind of any moment where she's really snarky. Mm. I'm just always, mm-hmm. always loving it. And so there's a lot of, there's a lot of really good ones in The Winter Soldier of like just her, her snark. Yeah. That I appreciate a lot. That's kind of the one I was thinking. Like uh, 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 until the Black Widow movie, I feel like Winter Soldier is the most screen time that she has is what it feels like really, to me. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. it's the most time that's devoted to developing that character, even though it's Cap's story. And so there are a lot of cool moments in there. What about in the in the Black Widow movie? Was there a sequence or a, a, a section that really stands out to you as like, yes, this is what I've been waiting for? Mm. There was a couple ones that I really liked. Okay. I really liked her first encounter with Yelena. I thought that mm-hmm. was just a really cool scene. Yeah, yeah. I really liked her conversation with the main bad guy whose name I don't remember. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> where she's kind of baiting what is him. His name? It's yeah. like Drake. 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 Uh, Drake, Drake, Drake. Yeah, something, something like, like that. that. <laughs> the guy who runs the Red Room. Yeah. <laughs> and she's, again, doing what she does so well, which we've seen since, mm-hmm. you know, the first Avengers of kind of baiting him and yeah. weaving him into her web, per se. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, I found that really satisfying. Mm-hmm. And then I think the the last sort of fighting moment of, like, again, where we see kind of that, her compassion. Mm-hmm. I that I think that was really mm-hmm. that was the payoff that I really wanted. Yeah, I I think I would agree with you that the that the initial scene with Yelena in the house when they're just kind of like taking each other apart, I feel like is just a really cool moment. Um, sequence wise, I also really like the prison break, but that's more like an ensemble mm-hmm. yeah. thing. But I just thought that whole sequence was very cool. Yeah. I wish that there was like I'm I'm I love novelizations. I wish there was a novelization of this movie, and there's mm-hmm. like nothing. That's out there. Not even a junior novelization. Mm, sad. I know. Maybe I know it could, is. You'll have to. You'll have to write it. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll get to it. I'll write some Black Widow fan fiction. So, looking forward in the MCU slate of movies, is there one that you're particularly excited about? Um, I'm excited. Well, okay. I'm really excited about the Hawkeye show, mm. which is a show not a movie. Sure. Of course. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that, and I'm excited about the like upcoming captain marvel stuff that mm-hmm. will maybe have ms marvel yeah in the it. marvels mm-hmm. yeah i'm hoping hoping yeah. that that'll be what, yeah. <laughs> really really great and mm-hmm. really um a great chance for those characters to shine i was uh, like i said i was not super into falcon and the winter soldier and i never really got into loki either but both black widow and wandavision i think are just so cool wandavision is maybe my favorite mcu thing ever i know it's a bold statement but i just i loved that show like i couldn't wait for the next episodes to drop i was really excited about that looking forward i think i'm maybe most excited about shang chi i like those comics like it's a, it's a very 70s kind of thing but i like the old comics and i really like that actor did you ever watch kim's convenience I don't think so. Okay. He's one of the primary stars of that. And it's just so funny and cool in it. And I'm just really excited to see the Shang-Chi movie. So I'm looking forward to that. Uh, probably the most. I never, I've read the original Eternals, like the Jack Kirby Eternals. And I was kind of like, eh, okay. Mm. So I'm not super thrilled about that one. Have you seen much about the Eternals? I don't really think I have. Okay. 
We just watched uh, Thor Ragnarok last night. We've mm. been going through and like doing a rewatch that's taking us years. And we finally got up to Thor Ragnarok. And I liked that movie better than I remembered the first time. Mm. Like it was a little, I just thought tonally it's such a, such a change, you know, that it was jarring to me the first time. Do you like Ragnarok? I do like Ragnarok. Yeah. I also though, I think, see again, also the watching it out of order thing. Yeah. Pretty sure I watched Ragnarok before watching the original Thor movie. That's disgusting. I was familiar with Thor's character from the Avengers. Though. Okay. And I still haven't seen Thor the Dark World. You know what? Thor the Dark World gets such a bum rap. And I think it's actually kind of cool. It feels like it's ve- the scope is very small. And it feels almost more like an episode of, of like a Marvel TV show, which I guess in a way is kind of what the MCU is. Sort but, of, yeah. Um, it's, it's low stakes and it's just kind of like fun and enjoyable. I get why it's not like at everybody's top. But I think you'll like it if you like Thor. Yeah, no, I you look know. forward to seeing it at some point. Yeah. I'm, you know. What, what's what's wrong with you? Well, some of it is just how my family watches movies. Okay. We as a family don't usually go to theaters. If I go, I go with friends. Okay. So then sometimes it's sporadic which ones I go to see in theaters. Right. And then we're just not always very organized about like watching mm-hmm. the things in order once they're released. And mm-hmm. so it's just a little chaotic. And then I'll randomly like watch something on my own. So yeah. it just... Okay. That's why. All right. Uh, I'll accept it because I have to. What are your like top three MCU movies then? Hmm. This is a good question. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) You're welcome. I really liked Captain Marvel, which I know is not a popular, not a popular choice, Mm -hmm. but I really liked that one. I like Captain Marvel. Yeah. Yeah. It feels like cheating to add the Black Widow movie. No, you can add it. Add it. Okay. Well, add the Black Widow movie. Uh huh. Beyond that. I'd say I really liked the Winter Soldier and I also really liked the first Avengers movies. Okay. I liked the later Avengers movies okay, but I feel like the more time went on, the more it just got so big it's, and stale. It's real chunky, yeah. Yeah, and I really like things that focus a little bit more on individual character mm-hmm. dynamics. And so as great as Endgame was, it just felt like a lot. And yeah. so hard to get some of that, which is what I really appreciate. Agreed. yeah. And so the earlier ones, the first Avengers especially, I feel like those are the ones that I really cling to. Yeah. I think, I mean, I can't not list the first Iron Man because it was, I I know you were a child at this point. I was a fully grown adult. And like watching that first Iron Man movie was just so unlike the superhero movies that came before it. Mm. And just, I don't know, I just hadn't seen anything like that. And at the time, it was just like a really revolutionary thing to think that a superhero movie could be that. Because up until that point, you had the Sam Raimi Spider-Mans, which were Mm -hmm. very... purposely tonally melodramatic and the (laughs) x-men series you know which was which which was a little bit more dark and then you had you know the chris nolan movies which are exceptionally dark and then you had like the goofier like you know batman forever you know the superman films and stuff and so for this to just be like taken so seriously but also just be I don't know, it just kind of subverted your expectations of what a superhero movie was. So I got to give it to Iron Man. Um, and I also really like some of the atypical ones, like Ant-Man and the Wasp, I think is really fun. Uh, Spider-Man Homecoming, I never tire of. Oh, I love, I love Spider-Man yeah. Homecoming. Yeah, but I mean, I have to agree, Captain America and the Winter Soldier is, is right up there. Um, I also really like the first Thor, and I would put Black Widow pretty high. You know, and as I said, WandaVision, it's like top in my list. So it's good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Because I feel like WandaVision in a similar way to what you were saying about the Iron Man movie mm-hmm. did things that just. Oh, yeah. Weren't what you would yeah. expect, but it worked so well. What I liked about it is that, you know, I feel like the MCU has really earned doing a show like WandaVision where you have to have patience, mm-hmm. you know, like the first two episodes of WandaVision. If you're not if you're not like entrenched in that world. I heard a lot of people say they just didn't like it. It was boring to them. It was just like spoofing classic sitcoms. Well, it's like, what's, it. I don't understand what's happening. Right. But exactly. it was awesome. You have <laughs> multiple episodes before you even get what the what the one line premise of the show is. You mm-hmm. have to be like three episodes in. And so the fact that they were patient enough to do that and trusted that we as viewers would have the patience, I just think really paid off in an exciting way. So, yeah. Yeah. I Anything agree. else? Anything else to add? I don't believe so. Okay. So Black Widow, two thumbs up for you. Two thumbs up for me. Me as well. Uh, And I am looking forward to the next time, like years down the road when we do a rewatch, of putting it right where it goes timeline-wise. I think we'll really add to your understanding of Black Widow going forward and make what's already a pretty 
you know, I don't know, it's an epic conclusion to that yeah. character. But I think having this movie in your mind when you get to that point will make that all the more meaningful. I absolutely agree. All yeah. right. Are you going to be reading any more Black Widow comics going forward? I am, yeah. Okay. Actually, the... um. The Edmonds and ones that you were just talking about are next okay. on my read list. All right. So. I'm going to pass really you the Kelly Thompson ones. ones. Yeah. Yes. I am so excited about those. Because those are super cool. What about Red Vengeance, the sequel to the YA novel? I am not sure. Okay. I can imagine reading it at some point, but it's not out. It's not currently on my list. We'll okay. See, we'll see if it makes it there or not. All right. Uh, let's talk a little library news. Do you have any teen programs coming up that you are super excited about that you want to tell us I'm about? I'm excited about every teen I know, program I that I have are. coming up. Um, well, something that we just started doing is having just open hours in the teen loft yeah. where teens can just come and pretty much do whatever they want within reason and yeah. safety and all of that. Yeah. Um, and so I don't know. I'm excited about that opportunity. to The just teen kinda, loft is decked out. It's my, when I was a teenager, cool. my library did not have that. I mean, there's, there's a switch and the Xbox and the foosball and like what else? Yeah. There's like coloring, there's perler beads, yeah. there's nail polish now because we had some for a craft. <laughs> and so if you want to paint your nails, you can do it do in the it. teen loft. Okay. There's like a little basketball hoop thing, mm-hmm. which every time I go up there, I like shoot one or two baskets just cause I have to. Yeah. yeah. And gradually my hand eye coordination is going to, improve one of, I one know of these it days is. yeah you're gonna nail it yeah upstairs uh, on the top floor of the library sort of a rarely seen portion of the library so I would it's, agree, it's a yeah. cool place to go up there uh, sloped ceilings and cool windows and things and nice views so yeah check that out okay summer reading program still in full swing Absolutely. through the first week of august and it's not too late to sign up and uh, enter to win one of the fabulous prizes yeah, I think we have some pretty cool <laughs> prizes. I, you know, I say being the one who picked them out. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, you know. I understand. But yeah, and we have like a craft or activity every Tuesday night at six. So okay, yeah. All right, exciting times here at the David A. Howe Public Library. It well, always is. we have many, many a Black Widow item right here in the collection. We of course have all the MCU movies on DVD. If you still have a DVD player, do people? Still have DVD players? Do I you believe think? so. Okay. I do, but I'm a bad sample size. We That's still true. have a VHS player. Do so. you? Mm-hmm. Old school. I oh, like yeah, it. Oh yeah, it's great. So we got all the movies. We've got lots in the graphic novel collection. Uh, we do have the the Black Widow YA novels you can find over in the teen section. So if this puts you in a Black Widow mood like it did us, uh, stop in and check any and all of these things out. We never turn down a checkout. Absolutely. We love we those do. stats. Oh, yeah. Keep them coming. We're here for it. All right. That's going to do it for this week's episode of How's Things. Allie, thanks for coming back. Thanks for having me. All right. We'll see you next time.